Hello. Um, can you hear me? It's fine. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, REST memory management. Uh, a bit about myself. I, uh, my name is Ishan Ali. I work for a company called Kinfolk. Uh, you might be hearing this name quite a lot in this conference. Um, and um, uh, a bit about uh, Rust um, before I get into the memory management, because if you don't know anything about Rust and I get into memory management, it won't uh, be very useful. Um, but I'm not going to go on about all the features and everything. I, I don't need to mention those. Um, uh, mainly, it's a systems programming language like C, C++, Go, uh, in those categories. Um, but it's uh, one of the first languages to ever uh, focus on safety and efficiency at the same time. Uh, there you will find many languages that are extremely safe, especially all those functional programming languages. Um, but they will always have some uh, performance penalties in terms of, for example, garbage collector at least. Um, and no matter how efficient you make garbage collector, there is always going to be some performance penalty of that. Um, so Rust doesn't uh, it aims to um, uh, not have a garbage collector and um, make uh, make have things as efficient as possible. Uh, very similar to C and C++ um, in in that way that you do have to do uh, think about memory, but not as much. And there is no uh, dangling free point like pointers that you have to free and you forget. And then there's a um, problem there. Um, it um, builds on something um, they call zero-cost uh, abstractions. So any API that you will use in, in Rust, for example, the iterators or something like that, um, they, um, they don't cost you um, more than they would in uh, any other language that is also efficient, like C and C++. Um, so that is at the corner of the cornerstone of the, of the language design. Um, Everything goes on the stack by default, unless you don't want it to, and then you have an API to do that. I'll talk about that later. Um, uh, Non-mutable state by default. So every variable is um, um, non-mutable. You can't, once you assign it something, the, that assignment, that binding is uh, permanent. You can't change it after that, uh, except if you uh, mark it as mutable. Um, and that makes things really easy when you have to uh, find out some problem that's happening. Uh, your problem is going to be always in, in the mutable states. Um, and if it's clearly marked which part of your code is, uh, which, part, which variables are mutable, it's, it becomes much easier to track down problems. Um, it has a strict ownership, ownership semantics. Uh, so as I said, uh, not like in C and C++, you, have to, you don't have to free things. Um, but it, um, um, it has uh, um, very strict uh, rules about who owns a particular resource. Um, and I will show you in the, in the code how, uh, what I mean by this. Um, uh, enums can have values. Um, I had to mention this because I'll show you a code where, where we make use of this. Um, so I um, thought I should mention that. And it, it's a bit even more complicated now. It's, it's not just that it can, has values, but it can be like a struct, like as you can see, the move part, uh, it's, um, uh, you have like variables in there. So, and, <coughs> sorry. Um, Rust has uh, traits. Um, it's, uh, to allow polymorphism in the language. It's, um, Rust is not um, strictly object-oriented language if you come from uh, other languages that are object-oriented. Uh, so you don't have um, classes in, in there, but you have similar concepts. Uh, and uh, you have um, structs, you have uh, traits, and through that you, you implement, um, you have a concept of polymorphism. Um, also, uh, Rust makes use of um, uh, traits quite a lot, so all capabilities are uh, usually um, uh, implemented uh, through the use of traits. Um, and uh, that's why, I, one of the reasons I'm, uh, I had to mention this. Um, and um, as you can see, it's pretty simple. You, you create a struct, uh, you have a struct, you define it, you, then you can define traits on it um, and uh, implement the traits. And uh, so that was a very quick intro to Rust language. There is a lot more to Rust than, than what I said, um, but it gives you some overview at least. Uh, now I'll dive in a bit into uh, memory management. Um, 
Um, I'll start with, with just giving you code samples and, uh, and then showing you what, what is wrong with them and how we can correct it. So this one, uh, if in any other languages you had this code, you would uh, assume this is completely correct and that they should just compile. So there is a function called add first two and it takes a vector, um, you can call it an array uh, of uh, integers and it just adds first two elements and return the value. Um, and main function is nothing doing, doing nothing fancy, it's uses an, uh, using a macro to create a vector easily, um, and it just um, uses that first two and then shows you the results. Um, the problem is uh, with showing you the results afterwards in the print function. Uh, Rust will give you an error. Um, uh, it says that the value moved here, and then um, uh, you can't use the value after you have moved it. Um, this is what I was uh, uh, talking about earlier about these uh, strict ownership semantics. So if you pass something by value, um, there is two things to uh, keep in mind. Uh, it depends on what kind of type it is that you are, you are passing. Um, if it's a copy type, which is usually all the basic types like integers, uh, floating point numbers, uh, booleans, all those, they are always copy types. Um, and they're copy types because there's a trait called copy which is implemented on them. Um, and if they're of the, that uh, uh, type, uh, then when you pass them to a function, they are always copied implicitly for you. Uh, and that's because there is no um, performance penalty for that. It's, uh, it's very simple and uh, you j uh, uh, the other function gets a copy of it and um, it keeps its copy and you, you have your, co your copy. And then that function returns, it, it um, uh, just frees its own copy and uh, the calling function already had its copy so it will automatically be freed. Um, but if it's, um, uh, there is something called move semantics in, in Rust. Um, and by move, I don't mean um, move uh, on, uh, moving the resource itself. And nothing is actually getting moved. The only thing that gets moved is the um, ownership of, of the resource. So most types are of this uh, uh, type, um, move type. Um, so when you pass to a function, uh, you actually uh, pass the ownership of that uh, resource to that function. Um, and um, many times that's not what you want. Um, you don't want to give a, on your ownership uh, of your um, of your resources to the calling function. You just m want to do it, you know, want it to do something, and it returns. Um, and of course, Rust allows that through a concept called borrowing. Um, you. Uh, which is very similar to pass by reference in uh, C and C++. Uh, mostly you call it that in C++, not in C. You don't use, say usually by reference. But you, 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 uh, by that you mean like you um, uh, pass uh, a pointer uh, in, in the uh, C lingo. Um, and uh, the function doesn't have uh, ownership, doesn't get ownership. So um, you borrow the ownership to the uh, resource, to the function, and uh, when the function returns, the borrow is, uh, you, you have the ownership back to you. Um, and that's uh, how most APIs you will find in Rust because um, you don't, uh, nobody wants to have APIs where, which takes ownership of the resources. Um, of course, there is a lot of uh, that all do take the ownership, but uh, it's very explicitly mentioned in the documentation why it's, it's the case. Um, the problem with uh, borrowing is that it's very temporary. So, for example, in, in this code, um, it's a struct that represents a helicopter and there's a registration sign for it. Um, and um, you, uh, you have a constructor for this um, uh, struct and a new method. Uh, it could be named anything, uh, as far as I know, but we call it name. Um, there's a syntax error here. Um, probably when I was editing the slides, I made a mistake. Um, but uh, that's uh, heli from the new is a return, uh, return type. Uh, there's a dash missing uh, at the return type. Um, anyway, uh, so this um, takes a registration and it wants to keep it. And um, uh, so uh, once it, it takes that uh, registration that belongs to the uh, constructor and the constructor is giving the ownership to the struct. So um, you don't have the ownership anymore in the, in the main function once you call the heli colon colon, colon new. Um, 
and you're using it again. So like, just like last time, you will, you will get an error because you moved the value um, and now you're using it uh, yourself again. So, and you can't do that uh, because you gave the ownership away. Um, and as you can see, you uh, get, get a helpful note that uh, why this is so. Um, so the string type we have is not implementing the copy trait. So Rust cannot implicitly assume that um, you, um, you want to copy this uh, resource. Uh, and it shouldn't be because strings are heavy. Um, so we come to something called RC, which is the uh, type that represents uh, reference counting. Um, and um, uh, basically, you, um, you, it's a container type. So um, you put things in it and of different types, uh, since it's a generic type. Um, so you can put arbitrary types into it. Um, and you just, um, and I'll just quickly go back to the previous code. Uh, in here, we couldn't have used uh, referencing because, as I said, referencing or uh, borrowing is temporary. So um, uh, the constructor couldn't have put a borrowed value into the struct. It couldn't have taken ownership of something it doesn't own. It's only borrowing it. So that's why we can't use borrowing here. So we need to use a reference counted object. Sorry. So you can only borrow it, but uh, what enforces this? What keeps it from the heli implementation from being around forever? Um, the, uh, if you look at uh, the, in this code, right? So in, in main, you have the heli uh, assignment, uh, the variable. So when it goes out of scope, it will be freed automatically. Um, the struct, and once the struct goes out of scope, then the uh, resources it owns will all, also go out of scope. And I was about to explain that the, in the reference county, uh, the RC, um, you can have multiple instances of, this, um, of the same um, uh, resource, because uh, there is different instances of RC, but the underlying resource, um, it's, it's shared between them. Um, so the, uh, when you call the heli new, uh, and then you cloned the, the registration, um, you cre created a new instance of the RC uh, uh, struct, like you, you cloned the existing one. So now there's two. Uh, one went to the heli constructor that it kept, and the other um, clone that, was, that we already had in the main, it's, it remained uh, assigned to the reg. So, but the underlying resource, which is the, uh, the string there, um, it remained uh, shared between them. So um, e each time uh, there is a, uh, you clone it, the uh, reference count on the underlying resource um, increases, and uh, when it goes out of scope, the, the binding, it um, automatically um, decrease, uh, frees the, um, that instance, and you um, and decreases the reference count on the on the resource that is being shared, and once it goes to zero, uh, the actual resource gets freed as well. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's there's things keeping ownership of other things. So like uh, the uh, heli struct is keeping ownership of the registration. Um, um, but as you see, like in here, you, we had to like uh, write RC string, RC string everywhere. You can uh, make it better by uh, uh, using a feature of Rust called type aliasing. So you just defined RCS and you make it like RC uh, string. Um, from the point of view of compiler, now they are the same exact type. Um, it will uh, automatically replace the all uh, usage of RCS uh, by RC string in your code, and it will work like as if it's that type. Um, for this particular uh, RC uh, string, there is only one thing being contained, so it's a simple type, so it's not very useful, but we will see in a, in a later example that it quickly becomes useful. Um, but the problem with RC is that it's not thread safe. Um, it's uh, made to be efficient. So if you want to share resources um, between different parts of the code um, uh, without uh, the, uh, and you don't have multiple threads, uh, then you can use RC and you should use RC. Um, but 
uh, like for example, this code, we are now, uh, it's the same code, but we are now adding threading to it. And I had to add one more method to demonstrate how, uh, how it will affect things. Uh, so now it has a hover method and it just shows uh, the self dot drag uh, the uh, registration. No, there's nothing fancy. And uh, in the main, you just launch a new thread and in that one, you call the hover. And um, you will, if you run this code, you will get errors from compiler again. Um, basically, what this error means is that um, you cannot share RC between threads. Uh, there is a trait that needs to be implemented by types that can be safely uh, shared between uh, threads. And that, that is not very um, lightweight, so there is a cost to it. And um, uh, that's why we have a different one called atomic reference counting, which is the same as RC, but it's thread safe and it's a bit heavier. Uh, you can use it in single threaded uh, as well case, but it's, since it's more heavy, there is no point of using it in, in that instance. Um, it's kind of the same code, except that I replace RC with ARC, um, and this one just works. Sorry? Uh -huh. And I think it's quite, quite the same, so I don't know if I need to explain more further. Uh, but the problem is that ARC content are not mutable. Um, it's, um, it's only about atomic reference counting and the resource. Um, and if you look at that, like um, the self uh, dot, uh, can I have the mouse pointer? Yeah. Um, the self dot reg, um, uh, when you use that, you get, uh, uh, you borrow the contained value. And the, when you borrow it, it's not a mutable borrow. It's, uh, uh, it's a non-mutable one. So, if you want to uh, mute it, uh, have a mutable resource, like in this one, I uh, changed the hover method to uh, do uh, some writing uh, and the clearing of, this, of the string. Uh, like I introduced a new string this time, status, and um, this won't work. Because, um, as I said, it, uh, the, when you borrow from arc, the internal value, it, um, it's not mutable. So you can't do mutable. You can't call methods that uh, assume a mutable reference. So this won't work. So you have another type for that, um, mutex. And um, uh, as I was saying, type aliasing. Uh, you, we can re use it now in this one. Um, but for the sake of demonstration, I didn't use it. Um, and to keep it simple, uh, you uh, basically just um, put it um, a mutex in an arc, and um, then uh, the mutex itself, you just uh, take a lock on it, and um, uh, that lock is an object itself. So when you get that, uh, as you can see, I'm um, uh, they, then taking the actual resource uh, by calling unwrap on it. Um, don't worry about unwrap right now. <laughs> um, but um, um, anyway, uh, you get a mutable reference, and once you get a lock on it, and then you uh, can do all the mutable, muta uh, uh, you can call all the methods that require a mutable reference. Um, and it works fine. Um, and the thing about uh, these locks is that when they go out of scope, they will automatically be uh, uh, freed and, um, uh, and that free means uh, unlocking. So um, when the hover function is done uh, method, you get the unlocking automatically. So you don't need to explicitly unlock uh, mutexes. Otherwise, it's pretty similar to the uh, just using arc. Uh, similar to um, uh, mutex, there is a read-write lock as well. So if you have multiple threads uh, reading uh, and multiple threads um, uh, uh, and a few threads uh, writing, so if you have a lot of reading going on and very few writes at the same time, then you want to use this one because it's a lot more efficient. Um, there is a thing called box, like I, as I mentioned before, you uh, everything goes on the stack, but if um, 
you want, you can put things on the on the heap. Um, and this uh, box is the, the way to do that. Uh, so this five in here is not the size of the box, it's uh, just an integer. So it's just a contained value, it's, um, it's a generic type, so you can pass it Boolean or any type, and it keeps it in the, in the box. Um, the, the box itself is on the, still on the stack, but the resource that you put in there, that goes on the heap. Um, this box is used a lot for C interfacing. Um, uh, where you need to pass arbitrary memories, um, memory uh, areas from the heap to, to the C world. Um, but there is also another uh, use of it, and that's uh, for sizing. So many times the compiler needs to know the size of the types. And um, uh, if you, well, let's see an example. For example, in this case, so you have a um, enum that is list, but it can be um, uh, a list itself as a member in it. So the, the compiler doesn't know how large could it be because a list can have a list and a list and a list. Um, so for that reason, um, you you can use a box. So, but the compiler knows exactly how much, uh, how many bytes a box takes, and the list is just something it holds inside it uh, on, a, on the heap. So it, the compiler doesn't need to care about that, and it knows exactly what size this, this type would, would need. So, um, yeah, this, this will work. Um, that's like a very quick intro to uh, REST memory management. Um, the, the main rationale for this talk is that uh, when people start with, uh, with Rust, they really have to fight a lot with the compiler. But once they're done fighting with the compiler, uh, the result is just magical because once your code compiles, usually everything just works and there's the debugging almost completely goes away. Unless you use a lot of those unwrap calls that I didn't explain <laughs> and I don't want to explain right now and have time. Um, so uh, you have one minute for the, <laughs> three minutes. Any questions? Uh, does Rust have something like in C++ where you have allocators, where you can uh, specify how the memory is, is allocated for your types? So you can have like, if you allocate lots of stuff, so you can be sure that it's in a contiguous piece of memory? Um. So when, when you do like a box of something, can you, as a user, specify where in the memory that will go? Or is it just the, the TC malloc or J malloc or whatever is to take uh, care of everything? Not, not with the box, but there is APIs to handle pointers. Um, and uh, that's his unsafe code. So you have to mark it as unsafe when you use those APIs. But you can uh, do, like, uh, you can create a pointer that uh, points to a specific uh, part of memory. And uh, you can do all kinds of things with that. But of course, then you're in an unsafe world. And, but you do have to use those APIs quite a bit if you're interfacing with C, because uh, you need to uh, do those things, like pointers and stuff. But usually, in, when you're doing safe REST code and not interfacing with C, you don't have to usually care about pointers at all. Any other? No? then I must have done a good job or something. <laughs> okay. So thanks for coming and uh, have a nice evening. <laughs>